Hello. So in this video, we're going to be talking about William Shakespeare's play Pericles, Prince of Tyre, which is, uh, in my opinion, Shakespeare's most oceanic play. Um, and so it's appropriate that I'm talking with Dr. Lowell Dukert, who is one of the rising stars, maybe maybe now one of the risen and sort of ruling stars of Shakespearean eco-criticism. Uh, so first off, Lowell, thanks for joining me. Thanks a lot um, for, for having me, Bill, and for, for gracing the, 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 the stage theater film so <laughs> really appreciate it yeah so uh very quickly i do want to say uh my computer seems to be running quite slow today which is uh which means that there may be a bit of a lag on seeing lol uh so if, if his if his screen sort of temporarily lags that's my computer's fault and not lol's fault all right uh, so Lowell Dukert is Associate Professor of English at the University of Delaware, where he specializes in early modern literature and the environmental humanities. He's published on various topics such as glaciers, polar bears, the color maroon, rain, fleece, mining, and lagoons. With Jeffrey Jeremy Cohen, he's the editor of Environmental Ecocriticism, Thinking with Earth, Air, Water, and Fire and Veer Ecology, a Companion for Environmental Thinking, which was nominated for the Association for the Study of Literature and, and Environment Ecocriticism Book Award. His book, For All Waters, Finding Ourselves in Early Modern Wetscapes, was published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2017 and was shortlisted for the SLSA's Michelle Kendrick Memorial Book Prize for the best academic book on literature, science, and the arts. He's currently completing a book project called Cold Doings, Early Modern Actions for Our Warmer World. Uh, I'll also mention that Lowell has published on uh, Pericles and eco-criticism before. And my uh, article that I've published on Pericles and eco-criticism uh, came out of a graduate seminar Lowell taught at WVU. Okay, so Lowell. Great piece. Well, thank you. Yours is as well. <laughs> Definitely worth looking into. So, uh, first question. Uh, can you give us a, a fairly brief plot summary of Pericles? Oh, this is, this is such a hard question. Um, I... The play is so zany, it's so wacky. Um, I, I will, I will try to condense it as much as possible. I will probably forget something and have to circle back. Um, I should also say that uh, I, I've often told my friends that I, I, I should have like a T-shirt made that just says "Ask me about Pericles" because I just I love talking about this play. Um, so I will try my best. Buckle up. Um, Story of Pericles. Well, it's set in the ancient classical uh, Eastern Mediterranean, so what, what is now Turkey, uh, Syria, and Greece. Uh, the protagonist is Pericles, Prince of Tyre. He has arrived in Antioch because he's trying to get a queen. Um, he meets Antiochus. And Antiochus's daughter, Antiochus says, you can marry my daughter if you answer this riddle. Unfortunately, the answer to the riddle is incestuous. The, the riddle is, it goes something like, I am father, uh, or I am mother, daughter, and sister. He is father, father, mother, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you put that together, it implies that Antiochus and his daughter in this incestuous relationship. Pericles says, I can't answer this question. Um, he's going to kill me if I answer it. Um, but then he realizes that if he doesn't answer it, Antiochus is going to kill him anyway. Um, so he takes off. Uh, he goes back to, uh, to Tyre. Um, Antiochus sends an assassin after him. Pericles is haunted, haunted, haunted by the incest that he's witnessed in Antioch. His really good advisor, Helicanus, says, 
here's an idea. Just go to sea, <laughs> like get out of town. Maybe this thing will blow over. Um, Pericles goes to goes to sea. He arrives at Tarsus. Tarsus um, has been plagued by famine. Um, they are eating each other in Tarsus. Cleon and Dionysa, the rulers of Tarsus, are just uh, waxing kind of nostalgic about the days that Tarsus was so great, and now we're eating babies. What are what are we going to do? Pericles shows up. He says, hey, I'll help you guys out. Here's a bunch of grain, saves the day. And then he gets word that uh, uh, it's safe to go back home to Tyre. So he heads back home to Tyre. Um, here enters one of the one of the storm scenes in the play. Heracles is shipwrecked. He ends up on the shores of Pentapolis. Uh, these fishermen rescue him. He says, where am I? They're like, this is King Simonides' kingdom. By the way, he's holding this tournament today. <laughs> uh, you should go to the tournament um, because uh, you're a knight, right? And Pericles goes, yep, yeah, okay, this is, this is what I'll do. Goes to the tournament, sees Simonides' daughter, Tysa, is smitten with her, is smitten with him. He wins the tournament. Um, he and Tysa are married. Tysa is pregnant. They go back to sea to head to, uh, to Tyre. Another storm. Tysa gives birth to their daughter, Marina, during the storm. Heracles thinks that she has died. He's told that she's died. He's also told that they can't have a dead body on board. It's, it's bad luck. So he puts Tysa's body into a coffin, fills it with spices, nice smelling stuff, throws it overboard. Um, Tysa's body washes up in Ephesus. <laughs> this, and you can already see how, how, how zany this is. Tysa's body washes up in Ephesus. It's found, it's brought to a local physician named Saramon. Saramon says, this body isn't dead. Uh, revives her, Tysa wakes up, says, where am I? They're like, you're in Ephesus, your husband and daughter must be dead. She becomes a priest at the temple of Diana. Okay, so we can kind of put her aside for a long time. Pericles, and when we could talk about this, for reasons um, that critics have debated, uh, decides to drop off Marina in Tarsus. He's like, I know Cleon and Dionysa, they owe me a solid. Um, they're gonna watch my baby for me. He drops her off there, he goes back home. Says he's gonna come back later. Okay, so now the play like fast forwards 14 years. <laughs> Marina is is uh, is like I guess like a young woman. Um, she's walking around in Tarsus. Dionysa is really jealous of Marina because Marina's really good at like singing and weaving. And she's better than her own daughter at all these skills. Dionysa sends an assassin to kill Marina. Right before the assassin kills Marina, pirates come. And of course, and they take Marina to Mytilene, Mytilene, uh, to a brothel in Mytilene and sell her into this brothel um, where she has to try to survive and basically like maintain her virginity. Pericles shows up, <laughs> we're, we're getting there. Pericles shows up in Tarsus, he says, where's my daughter? Dionysus says, ah, so sorry. Like, she died. Um, here's a memorial we, we put up for her. Ah, this, you know, you must feel terrible. Pericles just rips off his clothes, says he's never going to shave his head for forever. Next to the sea, is, is distraught and distressed. And then, yeah, goes off. Basically, just to kind of like wander the ocean, I guess. Um, so what ends up happening in the Middle is that um, Marina becomes known as this figure of conversion. So everyone who tries to come and, and basically pay for her, she ends up converting um, 
So uh, basically, like converting to uh, to more sort of I don't know proper virtue. I don't know. Yeah, virtuous sort of exercises, right? So these two men show up and they're like, I never used to like the like to hear like the the Vestals sing until this woman like converted me and I'll never like I'll never whore again, right? So Marina Marina becomes this figure of conversion. She maintains her virginity. Um, she meets the governor of Mytilene, Lysimachus, converts him. Um, and at this time they receive word that this ship from Tyre has been docked outside of Mytilene, and there's this really sad guy on the boat. Um, and, you know, hey, Marina, like, you're really good at, like, at, at transforming people, at converting people, um, at changing their circumstances. Like, why don't you give it a shot? Let's see if you can, you know, heal this man. So she shows up on the boat, doesn't know it's Pericles. Pericles doesn't know it's Marina. He kind of senses, like he has this sort of moment where he's like, she looks just like my wife and my dead wife. And he actually pushes her back at first for reasons we can discuss. Um, but what ends up happening is that uh, Marina plays a song and, and then begins this beautiful sort of uh, reconciliation scene which Pericles asks her her story. She tells it, the pieces start kind of being put together. He realizes that it's Marina. She realizes that it's her father. Um, and then Pericles falls into this trance. He hears the music of the spheres. Diana, of course, comes down and says, you need to go to Ephesus to create or to complete the, the, the story, to complete the family reunion. Pericles and Marina, with Lysimachus, go off to, Ep to Ephesus. You see Tiza, of course. Uh, Tiza hears Pericles telling the story about his reunion with Marina and says, wait a minute, I know this guy. And then another beautiful reconciliation happens, reunion happens, the three of them are united. Um, and then they, at the very end of the play, Simonides has died. So Lysimachus and Marina are going to go off to, I think I'm getting this right, they're going to go off to uh, Pentapolis and rule in Pentapolis and Tiza and Pericles are finally going to go back to Tyre and they go back to sea. And the narrator, Gower, um, says, everything is great, new joy wait on you, here our play has ending, and that is the story of Pericles. Um, in five-ish minutes, right? Um, it has, it, I mean, it has a little bit of everything. I mean, I, I, I didn't even talk about the syphilis. Like, it's this, it's got a little, little touches, touches of everything. Yeah, wonderful yeah. play. So, yeah. um, I, I think that's, um, that's a fantastic explanation of the the plot which as you say is incredibly complicated and a lot of the stuff seems to happen for no particularly compelling reason except that it's fun and interesting uh, so in that like there is there is so much in the play there's incest there's pirates there's human trafficking uh, family members die and come back to life uh, people are separated and reunited. There's adventures at sea, et cetera, et cetera. So might might it be fair to compare this play to like a modern, say, action movie or a thriller or fantasy film or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's actually a, a, a good analogy because um, the thing that... So whenever I teach this play, like... Uh, my, my students are like, I've never heard of, never heard of this play. They've heard of Hamlet, Macbeth, um, The Tempest. Um, Pericles is probably the, like the most popular play that Shakespeare wrote in his own time. And so he, he co-wrote parts of it with George Wilkins, who is a, a very scurrilous character, which we go into details of that. Um, but who's extremely, extremely, extremely popular um, and, you know, 
when the theaters were closed, when the Puritans took over, um, when the theaters were closed in 1640-ish to 1660, um, you know, or I actually say when they were reopened in 1660, one of the first plays, and maybe even the first Shakespeare play put on was Pericles, right? So it's kind of like, um, imagine if like all the movie theaters shut down and then, you know, um, which I guess they kind of did, but imagine if all the movie theaters shut down and no more movies were, were being were being shown, and then you think, well, what's the movie they were, we really want people to come back to? It would be something like Star Wars, right? But I, but Lord I think that um, Lord of the Rings, right? Yeah, yep. I mean something that's just extremely extremely popular, and I think that um, you know, oftentimes when I when I think of like who would I want to basically make a movie or direct this, this play, I, I always think of like the, the work of like, like Guillermo del Toro, right? Or, or Terry, Terry Gilliam, right? Like someone who is yeah. really good at, at blending sort of the fantastic, with the real, or just kind of like inhabiting that space, that liminal space between the two, but also can like really infuse it with with like pathos, like with with pain and and, and, and with trauma. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I would I would liken this to sort of um, a, a kind of a like a fantasy a fantasy film action kind of packed fantasy film. And if you ever see this play perform, I mean, it's just like it moves and yeah. there's set changes and there's, there's jousting and like there's all this stuff that just is just like eye candy, right, for yeah. audiences. So. Yeah, so I think that's a really good way to kind of to put it, like kind of a, yeah, kind of like a fantasy, fantasy action film. To stay on the the question of genre, though, uh, Pericles is generally classified as a romance. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit about Shakespearean or or Renaissance romance as a genre, and how Pericles fits into that category? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, Par so Shakespeare wouldn't have called the play a romance. So, romance is romance as a term is kind of like you know, find, develop, like with editors. Um, mm -hmm. I think in the, I think in the eighteenth century, eighteenth nineteenth century. I mean, basically, what a romance is is it's it's a blend of comedy and tragedy, or sort of like tragic comedy. Yeah, um, that's one way to put it. It's usually like late in Shakespeare's over, so it's um, *The Tempest*, *Winter's Tale*, *Pericles*, *Cymbeline*, maybe *The Two Noble Kinsmen*. Um, but the way I, the way I tend to, to think of it too is that it has literary precedence in um, medieval romance and uh, in kind of like you know Greek and Roman mythology so what i mean by that is think of it in terms of like trials and tribulations so even even the idea that like pericles is a suffering figure that under is kind of a passive figure and undergoes like storms like things happen to him right over and over again it's kind of job like in that way he just kind of has to like get through yeah. and get through and get through but it is also infused with things like the riddle at the very beginning, which is like, you know, Oedipus, right? Um, the jousting scene in Pentapolis, which is right out of Arthurian romance, right? Um, but, you know, like, like I said, they could even go further back um, to really like, and this is what I tell my students, it's kind of about roaming, right? I mean, there's no like etymological connection, but it is sort of like, a character like an Odyssean kind of character who is just sort of like set upon and like set loose, and yeah. so it's travel and travail at all at all times. Um, and you know Shakespeare's audience would have been another reason why the play was so popular is that Shakespeare's audiences would have been familiar with the literature he was pulling from, which included a very popular romance, a, a Greek a Greek and Latin romance called. Um, uh, or, or, or about Apollonius of Tyre, about this figure who is separated from his family and is eventually reunited with him. And 
that gets told by John Gower in the, in the 14th century um, in the Confessio Amantis. It, that gets told again in the late 16th century. So by the time that Shakespeare gets to it, it's a very popular story, a very well liked story. And you know, this is one of the reasons why he has John Gower as like his, his chorus. Um, but yeah, but it's a very it's it's really like at its core is about just yeah the, the travels and travails of a protagonist um, who is eventually eventually finds some kind of stability or unific reunification, but at, at a great cost. It usually, cost himself, cost to his family. Yeah. Okay, so that idea of the roaming protagonist or the, the wandering protagonist, um, obviously in this play that's specifically a seafaring protagonist. Um, and I, I had started this uh, video by saying that Pericles is probably Shakespeare's most oceanic play. So this is a very broad question that's right in your wheelhouse. Um, why is the sea or, or seafaring so important in this play or, or in the early modern context? Oh, yeah, I, I, I love this question. Um, well, I mean, there, there are a couple of ways to, to, to answer that. Um, so the play, so historically, the play composed around 1607, 1608, that's kind of right in the wheelhouse of sort of like British proto-imperialism, right? So, yeah. so Jamestown is founded in 1607. Um, uh, the English were looking for a navigable route to China, right? The Northeast and Northwest Passage for at least a hundred years. Um, you know, that the sea was linked to, to trade and travel and, and to empire and, you know, you could read this play as, I mean, even the way that it starts, Pericles is looking for a wife and a queen to, for an heir, right? And so, you know, yeah. some critics have, have this is sort of like patriarchal imperialism, right? It's Eng England is, is trying to get a foothold in the new world. Pericles is trying to get a genealogical foothold. King James had just become king. Um, you know, the start of the start of what is called the British Empire. So I think like when you're thinking about seafaring and oceans at this time, you are thinking about expansion and, 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 and colonial expansion. Um, expansion that's linked to the waterways that are right outside the playhouse, right? Um, yeah. So there's that. Um, for me, you know, I what really draws me to the, the, the play is that it's, not so much like the historical connections, um, but really like the, the agency of waters and the agency of, of seawater, um, what the ocean yeah. represents, but also what water does. So the Tempest, which comes out like man, four years or so after Pericles, you know, has the, the, the beautiful song by Ariel, you know, full fathom five, thy father lies, of his bones are coral made. You know that that's that, that's kind of seen to be Shakespeare's sort of imagining of like what happens when bodies actually like enter oceanic space? Well, they transform, right? The water does something to the body, becomes becomes the sea. Mm -hmm. um, but per Pericles adds a lot of peril, <laughs> right, to that, um, and. There's a couple of ways to, to look at sort of oceanic space in the play. And I think one of them is that sense of, of, of danger and that sense of uncertainty. So the first time that, that, that Pericles is shipwrecked, this is at the beginning of Act Two, he comes out of the ocean. He has this very Lyrian moment. It's like, cease your ire, you angry stars of heaven, right? And, yeah. Uh, he's basically just like, stop beating me up. Like, like the elements stop it, right? I mean, and but he also has this line, and I'm trying to, I'm probably going to get it wrong, but basically, is, is he says to the fishermen, they're like, well, who are you? What are you? He says, what I am, I have forgot to know, right? 
So the ocean has this way of diffusing the identity, diffusing the self. It kind of reduces you to this like zero state. Um, if you go to Act Three, that moment when Pericles is pushed his ties it off off the ship, and this is something that I, I the article that I wrote on, on Pericles is all about, like these twenty lines of the play, because I could talk about them forever. But when he pushes her, her body overboard, he doesn't stop there. He starts thinking about, well, what's actually going to happen to her when she enters the space? Yeah. And he has this kind of tempestian moment when he he imagines her body um, lying in the ooze in this like intermingling space of earth and water and transforming. And so on the one hand, you, so you have this sea as this place that kind of like wipes you clean, right? And then yeah. you have the sea as this place that like commingles and, and, and meshes and transforms and changes. Um, the body gets into bodies. And I don't think the, the play ever really reconciles those, which is those two, um, those two abilities, which is why I love it so much. It really wants you to think about like I said, like the work that water does to, to, to bodies, this, the ocean is a site of death and danger, but also the ocean is a site of transformation. And, you know, Marina is born at sea. So it's also yeah. rebirth. So they have to be, they always have to be in there together, right? Um, and that's what I find so fascinating about the way he thinks about salt water. It's not an either or, right? It's it's this, this uncertain, place of potential, right? Life, death, um, change and erasure, right? All bound up together. And he just wants you to kind of stay there and think through that, right? Um, and I, I have theories about how that, how the audience might have recognized that too, but that we could, you know, like, like I said, we could talk about that later. Um, but but that, that's how I see the sea, the sea at work. Okay. Uh, so I, I think that's really fascinating. And actually one of the things that, um, one of the other things that happens in that scene where Pericles comes ashore and meets the fishermen is uh, they, right, because they tell him, hey, there's this tournament you should go to. And he's like, well, I don't have my armor. And they're like, we will fish for it. And they pull his armor out of the ocean and it's all rusted and and he like puts it on and goes and wins the tournament and it so it is this it's not just like human bodies that get transfigured it's also uh we have that the the sort of possibilities of life and renewal because i mean because that's what uh, winning the tournament means right is is the sort of renewal of Pericles's fortunes and his his romantic hopes uh, brought to him courtesy of this rusty armor pulled out of the sea. Right, right. I mean, you know, it's that that scene is really fascinating because um, you know. The thing that can, that gives Pericles his sense of identity is the, the, the father, right? So it's it's the armor, but it's also sort of like it's it's yeah. the fan, it's the familial armor, and in a way, it kind of like um, it gives him a sense of stability, um, and it kind of puts him back on that path, that, 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 that like patrilineal path, right? The play yeah. becomes very terrestrial after that. But what I, what I love about what you're saying is that like, even that, even that, that the, the dry armor is touched by the sea. And so, you know, he's on land for a little bit and he yeah. meets Tiza, but he, he has to go back. And then once you go back, you're like he's in that, that kind of, you know, chaotic, uncertain space and um, full of, of oceanic agency and what's going to happen. Well, bodies go back in the water, right? Things yeah. come up out of the water, right? So the play never really, it's not like we have a little dip into the ocean and then we're kind of back on land and then that's it. It's like, you know, 
you're constantly going back and forth, back and forth. And um, what, one, one last thing I'd say is that, you know, you have the armor in that scene, but there's also this delicious line where the fisherman, uh, one of the fishermen says, you know, I, I know that there was a storm last night because I saw that I saw porpoises, I saw dolphins bouncing up and down in the water. And for early moderns, porpoises were signals of a shipwreck to mm -hmm. come or a storm to come but they were also sailors who had fallen overboard and had been transformed into dolphins so even as pericles comes out he's like i don't know what i am and he's entered that kind of zero state the fishermen are thinking this guy's like half man i think they call him like half fish half flesh right yeah. he's human he's fish he's fish he's human so pericles might say i'm wiped clean they're like he's been Used right with the piskeen, right? And so yeah. that like the, at every turn, the play is just like it just confounds our, our our ways of sort of separating things out: human, water, you know, um, fish, man, right? It's it just puts you right in that those kind of those like really kind of complicated middle spaces. Yeah. Yeah. So you had mentioned um, audience receptions of this play, and and I think it is worth emphasizing that the early modern English, maybe especially people in London and, and major coastal cities, had a much more interconnected life with the sea than, than maybe most, say, modern Americans do. Um, I mean, the the invasion of the Spanish Armada was within living memory in 1588. Uh, there were there were laws requiring people to eat fish on certain days of the week. Uh, people, li I mean, Londoners lived along the Thames, which was a major oceanic uh, connection for trade. So, how does all of this? Uh, this sort of interconnectedness with the ocean how does how does in your view how does that shape the way that people probably received pericles when it was first performed well this is one of I, it's a great question i mean this is what I, you know i wish there was sort of like audience reactions <laughs> like yeah. little surveys you know has this deepened your has this deepened your 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 attachment with the ocean with with watery spaces. I mean, we like, we know, like, for instance, like, so Ben Johnson, like, hated this play. Uh, but Ben Johnson is also, Ben Johnson is also a jerk. Um, uh, you know, he, he's envious. And right? I mean, he, he wrote this, like, really nasty review. He, he said that Pericles is a moldy tale. Um, and so even in that idea, yeah, it's a moldy tale, not fit for any dish, something like that. You know, but even in that that idea of like things kind of molding and, and decomposing, it does make me kind of wonder if, you know, people just kind of recognized um, watching the play, if they just kind of, if they recognized that kind of Shakespeare, I guess Shakespeare and Wilkins sort of engagement with corporeality right this this idea that um humans and water are, are not these sort of these these defined entities right that um we are liquid um and one of the reasons another reason why i, I like to think that is is you know um again i could talk about this forever but shakespeare almost never uses the stage direction enter wet and he uses yeah. it in the tempest and he uses it in Pericles, um, both very watery plays. And of course, there are like shipwrecks in Shakespeare and many of his contemporaries, but usually it's like a guy walks on stage and it's like, I was just in the shipwreck. Um, but not actually like, I want this, this actor to actually be doused, right, with water um, as he yeah. enters the stage. And, that moment that Pericles enters wet is also the, the moment where we were just talking about, where he comes out and says, what I am, I have forgot to know. And the fishermen go, he might be a dolphin. Yeah. Um, and then he gets the armor. 
he goes to sea and then he has that whole imagining of what happens underneath the ocean. So I, I would I would argue that um, I, I just think like at, at, at some at some level, um, you know, Londoners I think would have recognized right, that 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 messy kind of non-division between their own bodies and bodies of water, right? Like you said, as people who ate fish, right? <laughs> you know, uh, as people who got their water, right? You know, from conduits, right? From, from public fountains, wondering where the water came from before this like this aqueduct was, was built a few years later. Um, as people who might have been standing in the rain watching the show or in the mud watching the show who had to yeah. probably cross the Thames in a boat and were just like caked in the ooze right? watching the show right i mean yeah. um I, I would say like i, I think that as, as opposed to just being this sort of arbitrary decision which some people have argued like wouldn't it just be fun if we had the character the character enter wet i think it just doubles down on that on that theme of interconnection. Like, if you're not really, it's kind of like if you're not really picking up on it so far, you're not really kind of making that connection between you and the aquatic life, right? I'm going to have this guy in Trewet and you know try to make that connection a little more um, demonst like demonstrative for you. Um, so I just I, I really have to, to to think that 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 was. That was something that audiences picked up on and, and not just Ben Johnson, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the, the now, now what it now what it, what it did, I, I you know, yeah. but, but we could all right. But go ahead, sorry. I get too yeah. passionate about this one. No, that's totally great. Uh, so I was just gonna transition to the last question that I, I intended to ask you today, which is another sort of water-based question, uh, because the plot of Pericles is very fluid in a way, right? It ebbs and flows between good fortune and bad fortune, people lost, people refound, uh, a lot of movement around to the Eastern Mediterranean. So is it, like, is it just sort of an arbitrary thing if we say this the plot here is very fluid or is there is there some sort of benefit to thinking about the movement of the plot itself as sort of mimicking the movements of water of ocean water specifically so i i i think you're, i think you're spot on in, in, in talking about or thinking about the, the narrative the narrative narratological structure of, of the play um you know, kind of, not just like mimicking, but really, I think, kind of um, demonstrating, right, the, the vicissitudes, yeah. like, of human aquatic interactions, right. Um, so w there are a couple of things that, that make me that make me say that, because um, a lot of times it's really interesting. So um, a lot of times when people talk about the play, and even I've been saying this, like, it's so messy, right. And, yeah. Um, you know, just on the basis of like the printed text, like it is, right? But I think it's also really messy because it water is messy. Right? And there are moments when you're going to be in a storm and you're going to be doing this kind of movement, the swirling kind of movement. You're going to be on a boat and you're going to be thinking about what lies beneath, and Pericles is going to start going down, down, down in a more of a kind of a vertical motion, right? Marina, the character who's born at sea, has this these amazing this amazing line when we first meet her in Act Four, right? when she says, "The world to me is as an everlasting storm, Wor worry me for my friends." Right. So M Marina gets it. Right. She's like the the, yeah. the the motion of the sea and the motion of the storm, and she is ocean. Marina. Right. Uh, Things don't move linearly. They don't move in a uniform, like in a, in a single kind of uniform direction. They they go back. They go down. They go up. They go, you know, multiple, right? Yeah. Um, so I, so I think that you know, 
when we get to the very end of the play, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, I think it's really telling that they don't take a land route back to, to Tyre, Petopolis. They're like, let's go back on the boats, everybody. And I think, you know, when, when Gower, <clears throat> When Gower comes out and says, you know, here our play has ending, I think we're really supposed to kind of, which is the last part of the play, I think we're really supposed to kind of meditate on that ending. Because we've just spent a couple of hours knowing, or or just, I, I guess, just viewing, observing what happens when bodies take to the sea. Yeah, Things are going to get messed up. Right? And I, I, I again, I, I think that that is a, okay, going back to your question about the structure, I think that's, a, that's kind of built in, right? I think it would be a much different play if they were like, you know what? We're good with water. <laughs> we're just going to stay here. This place looks nice. Ephesus has a great temple, right? Um, like, no, I mean, it, so they, they go back to that place of potential of life and death and birth and transformation. And for me, and I think, you know, for a lot of environmental humanists, for now, like, blue humanists um, mm -hmm. what i love about the romance i think what really is why a lot of like early modern eco eco scholars are attached to the romance is because that's kind of our world right the world that we're trying to inhabit this thing we call the anthropocene that we can't really control we can't really understand we're definitely a part of and we're definitely you know adding to right when I talk about like climate change storms are yeah. getting worse um, but we we live in this place of, of yeah of, of, of uncertainty uh, and also a place of deep deep enmeshment with with terrestrial but also with watery watery creatures and watery spaces and so Heracles is sort of like a meditation on you know how do you, you know how do we inhabit that kind of that narrative structure where you're just you're you're flowing and going and drowning and resurging and how do you inhabit that space and i think that's kind of the question that we're forced to kind of like sit with at the end as opposed to just kind of being like everyone gets married everyone dies right you yeah. have to just you're in you're in that that kind of um yeah that 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 site of just of, of, of mixture and uncertainty but you're still moving right, to yeah. where we don't know. Um, I think it would be a much, much different play if, if someone tried to kind of, you know, even it out, right? Like, I don't want Guillermo del Toro to come in and say, all right, let's get, let's actually cap this off. Let's create a backstory here. Let's like, let's try to straighten out kind of these loose ends. I mean, I think it's supposed to be, I would argue, I think it's supposed to be that kind of multiple movies. You're supposed to just kind of sit with it and figure out where you are, where you're going, who's affected, who's protected, who isn't. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, refugeeism. Um, I think you put it right at the beginning, trafficking, right? I mean, Marina, yeah. is, the world is she's an everlasting storm, but she's a trafficked woman. and. Um, can think of oceanic spaces now as being now and that as then being deep spaces of uncertainty for trafficked women right and this is a yeah. pericles can be right in there can be thinking about um thinking about how to think more more critically of those bodies that are moving against their will it can really like it can really touch on a lot of things that we're dealing with now in yeah in the anthropocene so all right. Um, so let's uh, leave it there. Let let the audience of Pericles and of this YouTube video uh, continue thinking through these issues. Uh, so Lowell, thank you so much. This was a fantastic discussion of Pericles. I mean, Phil, it, I, again, I, I really appreciate you inviting me um, to speak about it. I could speak about this play um, in <laughs> My life, my, my, my lifetime, I probably will end up doing that. Um, <laughs> it's also just, it's also really good to see you again. Um, yeah. You know, keeping that WB connection alive. So. Yep. <laughs> so, thank you.